Well, Brian, we can't take more than two hours to finish this podcast, or else we have to die and start over. Okay. <laughs> yeah, man's right. That reference. Right. <laughs> oh shit! I guess we're starting there then. Sixteen million colors. With some havoc in your head. Greetings, junkies. Welcome to the Saturn Graveyard. I, I don't know. I feel like I had to get into the Halloween spirit a little bit there. Uh, but no, we're the, the Titan cast from the Saturn Junkyard. Uh, we are a podcast where we uh, ramble about mostly Sega things, but I feel like we're a little bit fast and loose with that as well. Um, really, we're just here to vibe. And uh, we are getting into the Halloween spirit. In helping me do so, I'm joined by an international cast of hosts, including Nuno from Portugal. How are you doing, sir? What's up? Very well, thank you. And hailing from the Great White North, it's Cameron. How are you doing, buddy? I'm good. How are you doing, Brian? I'm all right. Thank you. A uh, founding member of the podcast, Samuel, the Southern Sega gentleman. How are you doing? Man, like you said, I'm just vibing. I'm chilling out. I'm relaxing. I'm drinking my coffee, and I'm sitting here talking to a whole bunch of fine folk across the world. And for this podcast, we are doing a retrospective episode, one of kind of our deep dives, more or less, uh, into D, uh, the uh, Kenji Eno and uh, Warp creation uh, that was released back in 95, uh, I think originally for the 3DO, and then later for the PlayStation, and of course, the Sega Saturn. Um, and uh, to help us drop some knowledge and uh, share their enthusiasm for this game, as I know you're a, a pretty big fan of Eno's work, um, including D. Derek Alexander, uh, thank you for joining us uh, from uh, Stop Skeletons from Fighting. Yeah, uh, welcome. Thank you. thank you for having me. Yeah, and you know what? It's I'm glad that you have good D representation because you're talking about D, but then you got somebody with D in his name. So, <laughs> and also, I guess if you want to go even more international, like you know, me, Brian, we're we're neighbors here in Seattle area, but mm -hmm. I'm from Alaska. Yeah, you can see Russia from your house. I can. Let me let me tell you. Let me tell you about that Sarah Palin sketch and how cathartic and therapeutic that was. <laughs> Not to go too far back here, but like, man, I needed that sketch because that was a weird time. But he would make that joke about the seeing Russia from my... I heard that joke for years. That, that joke, like, permeated yeah. the culture. You tell him you're from Alaska, that's... I used to hear, oh, polar bears, moose, hey. And then after uh, Sarah Palin and that sketch on SNL, it was like, Russia from your house, that's, that's the joke everyone makes. And I'm fine with it. But it was uh, that was a wild time. But let's let's talk about video games instead. Yeah. At any rate, I understand the frustration of continuing to reopen those wounds, so to speak. But speaking of wounds, uh, there are plenty in the game we are about to talk about today, uh, and that is D, which is I don't know if anybody wants to give like a overall view of this or uh, just some basic game info, but. Uh, it's kind of the brainchild of Warp, um, which is a team helmed by uh, Kenji Eno um, back in the mid 90s. And I, I guess you could classify it as like an interactive film, sort of like a proto walking simulator that uh, you know, indulges in a lot of surreal horror themed uh, puzzles in a, in a you know, I, I guess I'll leave it to one of you if you all want to just summarize what this game's about. I guess I could do my best. It's it is well again. It is kind of hard to really describe so succinctly because what it what it does it was very very strange for its time because it is an interactive movie. It was sort of like you know imagine mist, but instead of uh you know when you hit forward and you walk into a room and it just kind of clicks to a new uh you know picture. It's a CG movie of your character walking into a, uh, you know, down a hallway through a room. And uh, it is very surreal. It is very dark. Uh, the story, it, it's, it's, a very, it's a very violent and uh, uh, kind of, it, it has a lot of just straight violence and gore and stuff, but also a lot of weird mystery and surreal imagery 
Um, it is also a game that has a two hour time limit. It does not have any pausing. There's no saving or passwords. If you do not beat the game in two hours, uh, you die and start the whole thing over. But it is easy to beat the game in less than an hour, which doesn't sound like a good good use of your money. Not a good value for 1995. But it's it was basically it was 95 was the same year that Toy Story came out. And that was an all CG movie. This is like an all CG game as interactive and as complex and impressive as that could have been in 95. And also a game made by. Just like, you know, eight people in a broom closet, just very uh, it, it would be an indie title today. Um, but the story and the mystique of everything, a lot of the horror gags just elevate the entire experience to be really meaningful and really impactful. If you can get it, it definitely is not for everyone, but I feel like this is a love it or hate it kind of a game. You just you load it up and you push forward on your control and your character slowly walks. And then once you're done walking, you're like, oh, that's it. That's the whole game. You're either in or you're out. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I feel like in a lot of ways, the fact that it is capped at that two hour, you know, time limit almost reinforces the, the, the movie vibe it's going for. But that also makes it something you can kind of return to around the Halloween season, you know, year after year. And it seems like a good game for that to just kind of revisit. It isn't a huge time suck. You can do it in an evening um, Well, you kind of have to. No, I I under I agree with Brian though. Like, it's it's a short game, but it's short for a reason. It it there's a point to it, right? Like, you're going to solve this. Like, you never you've watched a movie for two hours and sat there and went, well, why didn't they do this or why didn't they do that? I could have solved that problem faster. It, it, I mean, it is it is a movie, right? And that's what it is. They're saying you're the hero of this movie. And now you have to solve it, smart guy. You have two hours, right? And if you don't, well, you're done. And that happened to me last night. Like, I spent oh. just an hour in that first part of the house because I didn't know what the heck I was supposed to do. I had found everything I had thought I could find. I had gone to every room five times and looked around. And I was like, I'm dumb. <laughs> right? And... I was like, I can't do this. And then today, before the podcast, I fired it up again. I made more progress. I felt less dumb. I still felt dumb. Less dumb. Right? But I still hadn't... Oh. I would kept telling myself, dude, there is a second disc. <laughs> right? I'm like, I am so an hour like, in... a, And the, the story, though, is actually pretty solid. And there's a really great kind of twist at the end of it all. And I don't, I don't even know. Yeah, we shouldn't... I almost don't want to spoil it for you, because I do yeah. feel that... um. I first played this game in 95, so I was like 11 years old, and I just, it really, really messed me up in such a good way. It was a really a, a formative, like, horror experience. As a first-time player, like, I'm walking up to this game as a first-time player, no context, no references, no nothing, and just picking it up and going, okay, well, you're in this, you're in a creepy hospital, and then... You know, you get sucked into a portal, and that's the beginning of the game. Now you're in this. Uh, now you're in this mansion. What do you do? You have to explore the mansion. You have to look for clues. You have to find stuff. You're you're the main character. You're Laura, right? And things come and talk to you. And is that a clue? Is that a clue? Can I walk over there? Can I talk to this? Can I touch that? You know. So, yeah, if you've played it a bunch of times and you're returning to it and you're like, yeah, it's just an hour, it's not a big deal, you're totally underselling the game. Because if you've never played this game, you're like, you know, you might get like, oh, yeah, it's walking and it's kind of slow. But no, like, you're supposed to figure out this game, right? There is no, you know, clues. I sat here in the dark with red LED lights on to, like, give it the mood and, like, be in the zone. Because that's what Nuno read in the manual, right? <laughs> Turn off all I mean, the lights. It, yo, it's such it's such a good atmosphere. It really is a great yeah. game to play in the dark, though. All the sound and effects, the music is really minimal, but like everything is just it's it sets a good tone immediately. And there's creaks a, and there's things going on, and you're like, what the fuck is going on? Where am I supposed to go? And they and like Nuno was saying earlier in like the chat, like this game does not care if. You 
where you are in this game. It does not care how you feel. It is done. It is done. You know? Yeah. Can I read from the manual? Yes, please. Yeah, <laughs> yeah go for it. You know. <laughs> so I was checking the manual, and this is for the European version. I don't know if the US version is different. But there's a part, first of all, the, the, the manual is just full of, of nice quotes, like, for example, let me just open it up. So, warning, this game has no save function. That, that's a nice way to start a manual. Then it goes on to explanation of rules, time limit. Due to its story, this game has a two hour time limit. Laura, the protagonist, enters the hospital at three o'clock, but at five o'clock the other world is closed off. So the game terminates. Be aware of the time while you are playing this game. Note, in keeping with the time limit, this game does not contain a pause feature. And then, it tells you how to enjoy this game. To get 120% enjoyment out of your Saturn D, make the room as dark as possible by drawing the curtains and turning off the lights. Playing on a dark night is the best. Turn up the TV or audio volume. If playing in the middle of the night, be sure to wear headphones so you do not disturb people around you. Can you solve all the riddles before the door to the other world closes? And that's how the manual ends. Yeah, that's, 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 that's in the English manual here. I'm looking at the uh, Saturn. And that is how you sell a game or an experience. Yeah. However and, you want to call it. And I feel like it really does kind of respect that process. I mean, you know, thinking about other FMV focused games that attempted kind of that similar melding of game and film at the time. You had Myst, you had uh, what, Seventh Guest, like those types of games that were really puzzle heavy. Lunacy, heavy. Lunacy yeah, that, but they were like really focused on the obtuseness of like the puzzles first and foremost. Um, and they built an atmosphere around that for sure, but not quite in the same like explicit, you know, uh, I guess cinematic sense. From that school of design, I mean, I could see how Warp was really interested in just putting players in the shoes of Laura who would be confused in this situation, right? And trying to stumble around and and find out what does what and get lost and fail, you know, a few times. I mean, you, you're just like ported into your father's what brain castle or whatever. And yeah. so, yeah, you'd rightfully be really confused as far as like, what the fuck do I do? How do I how do I push through this? What do I and and luckily the puzzles are fairly intuitive, I would say, compared to like a mist there. You know, there's a logic behind them that as long as you you know, observe and, and find the right things in the environment, you can solve everything pretty intuitively, um, even if it takes a couple of attempts. So I really like that balance that it struck. And yeah, it just, I, I don't know, I, I think it really played into that vibe, uh, both mechanically and its narrative really, really well. And that's really the underlying thing here is, I think this game is maybe aged better because Kenji Eno was just a lunatic. He was an absolute madman. If you study his uh, his storied career, he just was always out there. He just had, you know, 300 level IQ. He and, and his games were not always great. Um, the other two games that kind of are in the, in the D trilogy, Enemy Zero and D2, uh, all kind of have some pretty glaring flaws, but they all just go for it. All of his games just kind of are just interesting and weird and i really feel like now is the best time to play d i know we're talking on you know we're talking saturn here but d is also available on good old games and uh, steam and i think it's only like five ten dollars and uh i think s selling this game today because just there's so much more experimentation in the indie community so much has so much more representation in the gaming community i think this is an easier sell now but the fact that this guy made this game in 95 is just just insane. Yeah, um, that's it's wild. Such a, it's, yeah, it's such a great, simple, fully thought out idea, but you really have to punch the ticket and be on board with it. But I don't think he could have done it in 96. I don't think he could have done it in 97. I think by those points, it, it, it would have been a harder sell. I know that he already was doing Enemy Zero and D2, and those were progressions. 
I've never played those either, so I can't be like, oh, they're an evolution or a better representation of the times. But I, I just remember at the time myself hearing of D2 Enemy Zero and being like, that, that doesn't look like anything that appeals to me. Like, you were like, at 11, I played, you know, D, and I'm thinking to myself, man, at 11, I was playing Sonic the Hedgehog. <laughs> Well, D, D, yeah. and D, D2, and uh, Enemy Zero, all three, even though they all have the same the same spirit, they're all three very different games in my perspective. Um, spoiler alert, fast forward 10 seconds, whatever. D for me is basically Laura's two-hour acid trip and journey to patricide. That's literally what that game is to me. Whereas Enemy Zero is a just frightening onslaught of the senses. What the hell am I going to do? How do I get, how am I going to go five feet down this corridor? Um, and then D2 is in my, for me, at least the way I remember playing it and the experience I had from it was that it, it was kind of like just a, a romp through a romp through the, the, the great white. Um, it was enjoyable. The story for me was enjoyable. I liked the, I liked what, the gameplay mechanics were, and I like how it transitioned from Enemy Zero because I, I I knew it was a continuation of that. So whenever I first played it, it was it was I was expecting something like Enemy Zero, but I was completely wrong, and I very much enjoyed it. So the other two games have like as 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 the the games moved on from D Enemy Zero D two, they had more like traditional gameplay ass gameplay, whereas D is just uh. The only fail state is the time limit or if you want to have the bad ending. Um, there's no real like there's one quick sequence that kind of is very Dragon's Lair esque. But uh, the fail state is you just try again. Whereas in Enemy Zero, they're actually first person kind of shooter ish type segments. And then D2 and that's what had, I kind of mean by like you couldn't sell D in like 98 or 99. Yeah. Nobody but then would again, have been I, like, oh, no. I, I, I do think that like. <sighs> You might be right with that, but I, I think there is still a a aspect of Enemy Zero and D two that is just they're they're much bigger and there's just more to them. And the, the, you know you can talk about that for what it is. D is such a simple, small little kind of perfect. Oh no, and game. I appreciate that now. And yeah. like you said, we can appreciate that now in 2022. And personally, I see it more as myself appreciating it as an adult instead of a kid. Like at 12, 15. 18 i would have passed on this game i 100 percent would have passed on this game the the walking's too slow um there's no real thing telling you anything at all there's no hand holding so there would have been gone and it's over in two hours like yeah, like everyone said it's it's too short air quote but if you're 30 years old and you just want a game to play for like the night put that on you know you all it'll take is two hours if you don't finish it in two hours, oh well. It's also three bucks on GOG right now. So there, I mean, yeah, there exactly. you go. Yeah, so, exactly. I mean, it's, so it's a, it's a Netflix, not not even a Netflix. It's a red box rental. If anybody even remembers those. Exactly. At, at best, you can. Oh, I'm just going to rent this game, and then every so often you can like try to play it. That's it, right? And and I guess like, and we're selling it maybe a little short. There is uh, bits of replay. Uh, like I said, there are like technically two endings. They're not vastly different from each other but uh i was talking with brian last night um there is uh, all these flashback sequences and you had you yeah those uh, happen at random times yeah i didn't realize that i was actually thought like no you have to do because when you first get there you you, you, tr you try and leave the, the the mansion and you can't and then there's you know, one by the walk. mansion and i thought that was there but then i ran into it later in another room on my yeah, second I, play yeah, i thought like because I, I thought that the game was like you had to try and leave and if you don't try and leave uh, you're not going to see uh, the thing that's that starts the flashback, um, but it didn't happen for me. So I was like, "Oh crap!" Yeah. I maybe I missed it, but then I found it someplace else. So my my gameplay last night, I did manage to get all four. Which even though I played this game, you know, dozens of times over the years, I've only ever found all four of the flashback things. Man, maybe like three or four times, I always miss one or the other. But it didn't dawn on me until just now. Like, oh yeah, it is kind of they're either random or like it picks a certain set when you load the game. Uh, I, I, I don't know if there's any kind of <laughs> I don't know if there's a speed running community around this game that's like figured that the, the tech out. But uh, there is a there is reason to play it again. It is 100 percent a movie. There is some interactivity 
Uh, there are little bits and pieces that you can miss. It is so there is that openness of a video game. However, the major story that may, you know, the ending. Yeah, two hours in and out. It, it is not a, a, a uh, again, 95 paying 50 bucks this game. I don't know, but three dollars on good old games is absolutely a hell of a bargain. Yeah, and I'm also wondering what they were selling. I mean, was just the novelty of this more immersive? Yeah, you know, because like when you look at still screenshots or even footage of it, like this looks like something ahead of its time. Uh, or yeah, but it's 95 now. though. If you think about 95, you got to put that into perspective. That 94, we were still on the Sega CD. And one of the things about Sega CD that at least my takeaway from it as a kid was, is that's where they were trying interactive video type movies like and games. They thought that that was going to be the wave of the future was going to be like almost like a movie. There was an interaction with that kind of thing, I guess. And that's when they had like Sony and a bunch of other guys. And you got like um, those kind of games like Night Trap. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And I think if you look at D in that regard, then it's like, this is the last version of that type of game. This is what that evolved to. And this was like the crescendo. The ending note was D in 95 yeah. on the Sega Saturn. And then that genre basically came to an end. Right. Because nobody was going to play that kind of a game. Again. I, I think comparing this to Night Trap is maybe the most apt kind of analogy. It's like. D is Night Trap, but it's all CG and it's actually good. Yeah, exactly. It is 100% CG. It is actually good. You feel like you're in that game the whole time. Like, Laura looks really good. Like, I'm like, oh, these are pre-rendered. I'm like, it doesn't matter, though. They look really good. You know, all things considered. Like, this is yeah. Sega Saturn. This is 95. You, what kind of computers? Like you said, Toy Story had just come out, right? And yeah. If you, if, again, if you put it in that context and you're looking at Laura and you're looking at the world she's in, you're like, OK, well, this is actually really good. Like, I think something that people that we ourselves right now are missing is the fact that, yeah, we're Sega Saturn. We're talking about it on the Sega Saturn. This was not a Sega Saturn game. This was a 3DO game. This was designed yeah. for yeah, the 3DO, which was a console that was already like two years or almost or already yeah. past its prime. And it was built around those kinds of FMV experiences. We're talking about a fifth generation console. Technically, the 3DO was a fifth generation console, but it really fit into a more of a 4.5, very much yeah, similar yeah. to the Atari Jaguar. It was a bridging gap between the two di the two bit world and the three bit. I mean, not two bit, the two D world and the three D world. This was an entirely different era. If this game had come out or been, or if, if Kenji Eno had started development on this game in, let's say, mid-95, it, it probably would have never happened like this. It would have probably been something more accustomed to the, the game that would become synonymous for horror in 1995, which was Resident Evil. So, I mean, there's... there's probably a, would have been more like Resident Evil had it come out just a year later. Like, I 100% believe, believe that. Maybe not Resident Evil per se, but something along those lines. I mean, no, no, I agree with you because you yeah. would have been able to move your character more freely through the world instead of just scene by scene. And I mean, we saw that with the evolution of this franchise. Whenever it went to Enemy Zero, we had actual gameplay mechanics where you're going down a hallway and people like me who were at the time eight years old had no place playing Enemy Zero, scared out of my fucking mind. So, um, there, there, there is that mechanic to it. We have to understand when the game came out, what was present in the 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 broad landscape of gaming, and what we actually have of it. Because I think a lot of times, at least for me, and I'm not trying to speak for anybody else, I think about these games as Sega Saturn games because that was my first experience with them. And I have to remember that the Sega Saturn wasn't the be-all, end-all of that generation, and that a lot of games that I played on the Saturn were were ports from other consoles, and that the Saturn was not the main priority for that game. But even that said, right, like, even me going like, oh, it's like 95 Sega Saturn game, right? In my head, I know that this is something that I have to cut slack, because at that point, we didn't even really have, like, the PlayStation or the N64, really. And this is what we had. Right. Even if it's a port, I don't care if it's a port, you know, the scaled down window and eh, nah, it's still it, there. It still it, looks even, good. 
Yeah. It still plays good. It's still the a good game. The music is still fantastic. The audio is still it's, great all around. It is. It's not like a bad port like Doom where you can criticize it or be like, well, I have to cut it some slack because it's a port. Or if it was a PlayStation game first and then it was a port, and you're like, well, I have to cut it some slack because of whatever. I'm cutting it slack just because it's from 95. Right? I'm going, this is from 95. Like, it's, it's basically a point-and-click adventure game from a PC, you know? I really appreciate the, the technical aspect of this game. I had never played it before. Um, I actually can imagine that if I had played it as a kid, it would probably have blown me away. Just the, the quality of the, um, of the CGI of the pre-rendered backgrounds. And also probably would have scared the crap out of me, <laughs> like it did with Eric. Yeah, um, no, it was a formative experience for me. I, my brother, I watched my, actually, I watched my brother play it, but we totally turned the lights off, stereo up, and I just remember it scared, yeah, scared the crap out of me. Yeah, I, I can totally picture that. I mean, there were a couple of jump scares that even kind of scared me nowadays. So I, it was first time, the very first time that I was exposed to this game. I didn't really know what I was getting into. And uh, well, in gameplay terms, I kind of sympathize with Cameron because I did feel it, it took me a while to get accustomed to the movement, to the fact that you really have no control. You, you just pick a, a direction and your character moves there automatically. And I was coming from, I've been on a, uh, an FPS binge lately on the PC, playing a lot of FPSs. So it was kind of jarring to go from a game where you have absolute control of the movement and camera to a game where it's all pre-rendered. And yes, Cameron, there, there are a couple of spots there in the first area that I also missed and I was, I, I kind of got stuck there. <laughs> but then it actually gets easier, the second area. Yeah, once you get past a certain point, I felt like the puzzles got a little easier. Yeah, but at first yeah, I yeah. felt... Nah, yeah, but... wait, wait till you get to the third area. I don't know, the third area is a little <laughs> juice. Okay, oh, yeah, the first area is quite something. But let me just finish my point about the about the technical aspect of it, which, well, obviously, playing it nowadays, it doesn't have nearly the same impact that it, it had back then, because nowadays you can we have real-time graphics that are magnitudes better than this, while at the time, this was state-of-the-art, and real-time graphics that you could get out of the Saturn wasn't nearly... It, it couldn't touch this pre-rendered stuff. Um, and of course, nowadays we can actually criticize stuff like the compression artifacts that you get from from the video having been compressed, so the Saturn could play it. But the actual modeling and the construction of the world and rendering of the world and the position of the camera, I really appreciate that it gives you a great sense of presence. It gives you a great sense of the. It gives you a feeling of the the virtual space around you. Um, I don't know if I <laughs> if I'm getting yeah. this point this point across, but I I never felt lost in the sense that I I understood every room that I was in. I understood what was around me and where I could move. And exactly, um, I agree with it, that. You had a great sense of of space and of presence which wasn't really universal when you were talking about graphical adventures because there were games like, uh, um, I, I think, Myst played like that, where you just clicked where you wanted to go and you kind of teleported there, kind of like you do with VR nowadays, so it's kind of going full circle. And that teleporting was, was disorienting because you, you kind of missed the, the half point between the first area and the second area by just moving that there automatically. And because in D you actually watch your character move that, move that to the to the next location, gives you a great sense of space. And just the the 3D aspect of it, I know a little bit about 3D modeling. I'm not very good at it, but I understand, but I understand the rudimentaries of creating of creating a space, uh, of modeling objects, of texturing, of placing lights. And I just, even though, as I said, I'm not very good at it, I understand it enough to appreciate the work that went into this. And to think that this was programmed, this was made in PCs. I, I read somewhere that they used Amiga 4000s. I had to look that up. It had a Motorola chip that was really popular at the time. But th these PCs were... I, I actually went on YouTube to, to see, to look up what kind of 3D software they had for these kind of computers. Um, how, how it looked like, what the interface was like, what it was like to model stuff on those, on that kind of software. And it just blew me away. I mean, 
imagine creating mapping out these huge interconnected areas um, texturing everything modeling everything and then um, animating your character there are a lot of cutscenes uh, that showcase the, the the animation of your character and to program not, not program per se but to model this to to work to make this stuff on such old PCs at such low resolutions, it blows my mind. I mean, it would be a lot of work for me nowadays on my full HD monitor using, uh, I, can't, I can't even remember what software I used on a class that I took a couple of years ago where I learned modeling. can't remember anymore, that doesn't matter. You, you but, bring up a really good point. Uh, I, that's one thing I think, a really subtle thing I like that this game does very well is, is the movement of the camera uh, cause y y you, you play in first person majority of the time and it'll sometimes cut to, uh, Laura, you know, walking up the stairs or opening up a door, but there are a, a lot of moments where it's first person and she'll turn and you can see her kind of recoil, react to seeing something and the camera will kind of move back and bob up and down as yes. though it's yeah. mapping really perfectly. Somebody recoiling in like, like pulling back on something like, Whoa, what is that? And it really does feel a very natural movement, very natural emotional. Like it's conveying that emotion of shock just with a subtle movement of the camera. It's just yeah. so on the experience. It makes you feel like you're really there. And I think that's something that you can take for granted when it's done so well. You, you, you probably, most people probably don't even think about that. It's one of those things that you only really notice when it's done badly. And, and it's hard and you need to, to really uh, have dedication to even think about about small uh, little elements like this that when you get those right it it really makes all the difference in the world yeah and i mean to piggyback on all that what i would add to it is how well i feel it or how much of a testament it is to warp's understanding of what makes horror effective right and and derek as you were saying that the idea that it would pull back every now and then to show a reaction to show Laura just how, you know what her psyche is like in that space and how the events that I mean, we're not necessarily always seeing on screen but how what's happening in that space affects her uh, I mean we're with her every step of the way whether that is physically whether it's slowly slowly walking upstairs opening drawers but also just yeah like understanding yeah, I guess the, the sense of that horror through how we're seeing her react to it. And it's something that I actually have appreciated more uh, thinking about how our how games like when they tried to implement narrative or I'm sorry, uh, cinematic aspects going forward, where, as you all alluded, I think, Sam, you know, with Resident Evil and Metal Gear Solid and all those games that really did kind of take it a step further to uh, make those into maybe more or less action movies that you play uh, to an extent. What's lost in there is the way that they implement or interpret uh, film in those games is static. And so it's, it's the, they end up becoming such a interspersing of what we interact with, what we see, and then like cutscenes and it's all static cutscenes and we don't really have a lot of agency to do anything in those moments. We just kind of see all the action play out and see all the cool shit. Uh, and then it brings us back to gameplay. And I think a game that like took that way too far was uh, the bouncer, which I've been playing a lot lately. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I actually wrote about it on my blog, uh, which I don't know, maybe I'll plug later, but, uh, but one of the things that really bugged me is that it focused first and foremost on, uh, making it a, a film first and it was also like a couple hours it's like a feature length mostly cut scenes and then there's bits of beat em up action very awkwardly kind of plugged in there um and so that we like that game i i know reviews at the time just thought it a new one but they actually liked it yeah i guess where i'm going with there where i'm trying to tie it together is that that approach to narrative or to like cinematic gaming i feel like misses well, A, it doesn't take advantage of the storytelling uh, capabilities and strengths of video games as a medium because it's trying to operate on the terms of film and solely on the terms of film to, to try to tell that. And so I think that takes me out of it because 
I would rather just watch a movie at that point. <laughs> um, but D is so effective because it, uh, because the way it does immerse you just into the role of Laura, um, and and I think it connects us to that space, even though it's all pre-rendered, even though we can't move freely, even though it's all you know point to point, point and click. Uh, yeah, there's just so many artistic decisions that warp made uh that just make that i don't know just a very effective uh melding of of gaming and film. what you're saying brian like when a lot of a lot of games try to be cinematic they they take the control away from you they're like i'm cinematic now and you just get to enjoy spectacle yeah where where with d you're in the spectacle all the time like they never take you out of it Right. Like even in those like cinematic moments, they're not long enough to take you out of the moment. Right. And there's no health bars. There's no nothing. And it's and like you said, it's conveying all the meaning you need, whether it's the room like Nuno said, or it's the clues or it's the story. By some point of the game, you're walking around and you actually care about your character and getting out of there. And you're not so much worried about the CG or the slow controls or the stupid puzzles. You're trying to get back. You know what I mean? Like you're in the game now, which I was surprised by. It kind of reminds me like talking about the cinematic moments and then they kind of take the control away. That's something that Resident Evil 4 did really well because they would have Mm -hmm. like the QTEs in the middle of a cutscene, and you'd only fall for it like once or twice. But like you see, okay, here's a cutscene. You put the controller down, and then you get stabbed in the face because you didn't hit X in time, and then you'd actually die. That that's a good way to kind of meet that. That's mm-hmm. a, that's a good fix to a problem. But D didn't have that problem at all. It's it's Resident Evil Four found a good way to fix that. D just completely subverted that problem completely. Well, Resident Evil more or less solved a problem that it created itself in probably Resident oh, Evil true. like four yeah. or three or something like that, where D already knew what it was from the beginning. It was it was a movie, but it was going to be in this style. It had no Metal Gear Solid or Resident Evil or 360 gameplay to cloud it or to be like somebody saying, shouldn't it be like this? You know, Man, I just, like, I just, this, is, this is somebody who leaned full in and went, this is what we're doing. Well, I think also like you couldn't do full 3D in the kind of dynamic way that he wanted to at the time. So I would imagine no. a lot of like if it's like you look at like an enemy zero in D2, like D2, you know, is an RPG. It has like it has like random battles, you know, and it has just as many kind of big kind of uh, impressive set pieces and stuff. But the, that kind of dynamic gameplay just didn't exist on the 3DO at the time. So I'm sure for him, it's like, God, I really want to do these kind of big, elaborate kind of set piece type things in a horror environment. But you, the camera control and movement just absolutely was not there. Well, I'll just try. And, that was his that was his compromise. That was his way of making it still work. And I think that's kind of why that's another subtle thing. That's another brilliant thing about this game. What were you gonna say, Sam? I mean, I, I, I just want—I just wanted to kind of jump in and say that. I mean, this has nothing. That, it does kind of in a way, but you know, for me, I was one of those people who actually loved the aspect of the cinematic in games like Metal Gear Solid and Resident Evil. I was one of those people that was was looking forward to the next cutscene, was looking forward to the next ten minutes worth of you know in-game. I mean, in-engine video on Metal Gear Solid. I mean. For me, I've absolutely oh, always sure. loved that aspect of it. So, well, I mean, in Final Fantasy like seven, eight, and nine, I totally loved waiting. Like, because in those games, you'd play for an hour or two, and then they'd reward you with a cutscene, right? And it was like, oh, you've played, and you, you, here's a gift, right? But when you get into like the PS3 and the PS4, I feel more like it's like, here's a movie for two hours, and we will reward you with ten minutes of gameplay. I think a lot of people, uh, Metal Gear Solid 4 is a very good example of that by many, many accounts. I absolutely loved it. I mean, you're, you're going to watch as much, I don't know what the actual percentage of it is. I played Metal Gear Solid 4 from start to finish probably 20 times, and there is a crap ton, an absolute crap ton of cutscenes. Um, that's a prime example of the far end of it, but then you get games like The Last of Us, and The Last of Us 2, even though that's a whole different topic. But, I mean, there are games that have the ability to not seamlessly do it all in-engine. They do have cutscenes, blah, blah, blah. But the, 
there's always going to be games as art. There's always going to be that way. And yeah. D is one of the very first examples in the 3D realm of games being art. I mean, there's no way you can't look at D as a game of art. I mean, you have a two hour movie that you get yeah. to be a part of and you get to journey through this thing and figure it out. And like Derek said, you have multiple endings. Uh, there are little things that pop up that you'll see one time and not see another time. You can fail. So, I mean, it's interactive, but it, it shows the, the, the change. And this is something we've talked about plenty of times over the, over the years on this podcast is that the fifth generation was the testing ground for a lot of things that we know today. And one of those things is game as a true narrative, artistic, interactive device. Before the fifth generation, you didn't have that with the exception of a couple of things like uh, Dragon's Lair. That, that's a, a decent example. Another example would just be the fact of all the JRPGs that you know a lot of people love today from the 2D era back on, whether it be the NES, the SMS, or the Genesis and the, the Super Nintendo. So, I mean, that we have a cut a cutoff of sorts. And what we're talking about now is we're talking about games as art and we're talking about that development and that, that testing ground that the fifth generation was. And with D it was, I enjoy D still to this day because of the aspect of, I get to interact with it and I still mess up. I've only played it in the past couple of years, maybe a handful of times. And I promise you, I haven't beat it once. Whereas like lunacy Torico, every single time I play it, I pretty much remember every single thing about it because it's, even though you can beat lunacy in two hours, very rarely do I ever beat lunacy in two hours because it's me sitting there going through the motions. Oh, I got to go here. I got to go there. You know, and, and it's this elaborate world that I get to go through. That's also an FMV game, but it's, it's more interactive in that sense. Whereas D is like, you're on a fast track. That's what it feels like to me. So I, th there's differences with it. And I very much appreciate that faster pace of it to where if you want to beat it, if you want to get to the end, you've got to be on the move. And it's kind of almost like a, like a, I don't know what would be the, the terminology for it. Um, like a speed run thing almost. Whenever I play it now, it's more like a speed run thing for me. I'm trying to get there as quickly as possible. And that's why I always fail because I screw up. So, yeah, that's what I got. I think for me, when I was playing, when I was playing D, I felt more like I have never been into those cinematic, like, aside from JRPGs, like, I was never into, like, stuff like Night Trap or, or Sewer Shark or those kinds of FMV games. And I was never into um, Metal Gear or a lot of these other games, like The Last of Us, that put that same kind of uh, emphasis on cinematic or on making you more part of the world, um, where they eliminate all the HUDs and things and stuff like that, and you, you're just trying to be part of the world. Um, because I always felt like they took control away from you. Like you weren't you weren't playing the game. You were experiencing their world. Like it was an experience, not a game. And th I get that that's the point of games to art. But I guess what I'm getting at for me is that D impressed me, and it's still a twenty or almost a thirty year old game because it didn't take away my control. Every step of the way, I was in control, and every step of the way, every mistake was my mistake. You know, the game never went, we're doing this. Like, well, I guess it did, because I was getting chased by a boulder at one point, and I had no choice. <laughs> I just kept yelling at the screen. I'm like, run! Run, Laura! Run faster! <laughs> right? Um, like I said, you get a little involved that part, part way through the game, because now you're yeah. trying to get... <laughs> Can you imagine if you lived in that house and you had to deal with that shit every time you wanted to walk to your bedroom? Oh, no, nah, bro. That'd, that'd be a wreck. Yeah. <laughs> that house would be going on the road so quick. You can't skip leg day. Yeah. <laughs> nope. That is leg day. That is leg day. <laughs> and considering that, like Derek said, that this is a technical thing, too, where you could only do so much because we were in the fifth gen, where it's almost like D couldn't have existed if it wasn't for the fact that it was a port from the 3DO. Otherwise, it would have been Enemy Zero, and it would have been D2, and then we wouldn't have gotten D. Like, well, I mean, that's assuming that the Capital or, or Goodwill even existed for, for those games to... to no, I know. I know out. what you mean, right? But if you've seen what he did later afterwards, and like, if Sam was right, and it was something he wanted to do at the time, but just there was those limitations, it's like, well then we would not have gotten this game at all. And I think that would have been a shame because I think this is the best 
cinematic type game that I've played, and I don't like them. If I seen this game sitting on a shelf somewhere for for the right price, I would definitely pick it up and not be a, not be ashamed that it's sitting on my shelf, and I you know, only play it once in a while. I think it's a really good movie. I feel like there's also a through line in all the examples uh, that you and Sam gave of just different ways that games approach storytelling. I mean, RPGs maybe were more modeled after novels or or plays, even like you know mm -hmm. if you're reading it as a as a script. Um, and I feel like there's that's kind of where a lot of my enthusiasm for games as a narrative uh, vehicle. I, just, I really love the the diversity of approaches that they yield because you can do a lot through, I don't know, through uh, the compositions and, and music. You can do a lot through uh, text. You can do a lot through cinematics. But the thing that excites me most are games that are, and I kind of alluded to this earlier, and I think we all did, but games that give us uh, an active role in that space so as directors as performers as clothing designers if we're like or casting if we're able to create our own characters right there's so many uh, like games have just such a broad array of ways that they can uh, help involve the player in telling and crafting those stories um, and some of my favorite ones are ones where those the you know the the most memorable narratives come about through just the way we interact with that space, the way the systems react to us, and the kind of surprising and unexpected possibilities that 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 can yield that build a very personal experience for uh, what we are getting out of that uh, narratively, independent of the authored and uh, bits that are just given to us uh, from. So the wild was a lot that. like that, though. Yeah, um, and, I think that was their their whole idea with that game. Yeah, and and it's a and it's approach I see more and more in you know indie space. It's like how can we use the potential of games to really connect people and tell a, a personalized story uh, using the the assets that the medium has inherent, if not exclusive to it. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, pretty much every other authored medium, film, TV shows, whatever. Like they. Uh, novels like they are very explicit in giving you exactly the imagery and information that the author and uh, the production wants you to have. And beyond that, you know, the, really the only agency you have is just in how you interpret uh, the the information you're given. Um, whereas games kind of go off the rails a little bit and let you take an active role in that. So, and I think D was just an example of of a game that did that so well um which i think is something i just appreciated more and more after playing something like the bouncer well another game i want to throw out that i kind of is in this similar pool remember the the order 1886 yes it was a really, I really whatever big... happened to that game it was like yeah. a big deal and then it disappeared because I, I think it was similar to like the bouncer that like it was cinematic and it was beautiful but it was like two hours long and mm -hmm. i have not oh. thought about it i yeah. have not thought about it i had a friend who like swore by it and i was like okay whatever i kind of want to see I, I can't imagine it'd be a very expensive game now but i kind of want to track that down yeah this conversation yeah. has kind of got me really curious I, about that i can i can uh give you my copy if you want yeah that, i mean i put I, just borrow it for a night and then give it right back to you <laughs> you wouldn't need much well here's the thing here's what i liked about that game and most of my memories with it are with photo mode um, and so that toying with that became more of the game than the actual like cutscenes or shooting or, or anything that was actually like intended to be that part of that experience. Cause they did have a pretty kick-ass photo mode and it was like one of the first triple A games that really gave us those tools. And so I spent so much time trying to like frame things and around like the London skyline and, and the different characters and objects. And there's a lot of Easter eggs too. So it does a little bit to play with like exploration um, in the finite space it gives you. So that's where I had the most fun with it. But yeah, I mean, as a, as a just strict, you know, authored narrative, it's, it's pretty, pretty bland, I think. Oh, okay. I think I want to talk about one last thing about this game that uh, we've been talking about how kind of like philosophically where it sits in the pantheon of games, what it did right. You can't talk, you can't separate this game from Kenji Eno. There's been one story about it that is really interesting, but 
has always there's aspects of this kind of behind the scenes story that never made sense to me. Well, when I thought about it, I was like, that doesn't quite add up. Do we want to put a spoiler alert here? I, 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 I will. I, I will. Because we totally can. Like, I, 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 I can talk about it without actually spoiling it. OK. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead. Well, it's basically there is, you know, a, a big twist at the end. Um, if you can get all four of the uh, the little bug scarab things uh, where uh, basically, though, there there is a, a, a murder cannibal twist that happens in the game. Um, and it's 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 quite shocking. And the game is rated T for teen. And I don't know how how, how that happened, because uh, not even just that sequence. There are a couple of sequences throughout the game that are pretty grisly, pretty violent. Seems like an M rated game for sure. Uh, the story goes that a lot of like that whole all those flashback scenes that uh, happen that are kind of the bulk of the twist of the story that Kenji Eno uh, animated by himself in secret. No, like other people in the the dev team didn't even know about it because he knew that if if he put that that he, it might get an M rating or it wouldn't happen. People wouldn't make the game. So the story is he made these in secret by himself and then purposefully submitted the the final you know gold uh you know cds late so we have to hand deliver them and then he snuck in the extra cutscenes, knowing they wouldn't have time to review all of it so he snuck them in that's how it got a teen rating or you know didn't get a, a mature rating for the 3do version but i but then the question is like for the saturn and playstation versions did no one then play the game all the way through because they're no, like you said, of... you aren't going to get all four of them necessarily. Yeah, and I guess like technically, it's the third and fourth ones is where. Right, shit, I found two of them. The shit gets real. Um, right, I got it, two of them. The kitchen table is like the first one, which you're you're going to get right. Or the uh, well, actually it, yesterday, it, I found it, it on the uh, the bookshelf, the uh, yeah. the ca- the cabinet with the drawers is where I found the first one, um, which I'd never found it there before. Uh, I actually you, you, you found it. Sorry, I was just saying. Oh, no, no. The, the, no, go first, for it, yeah. The first one I found was actually on the door that's behind you when you start the game. So if you try to exit back. That's where I found it the first time. But the second time I went through and played it this morning, it was upstairs in the drawers. Oh, okay. yeah. You know where that's you get the piece of paper it. that gets the that gives that's, uh, four, four to two? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The blank piece of paper or something. There's a blank piece of paper. <laughs> yeah, the, in that the first time was, I thought it, I missed yeah. paper. The first time I opened it, it was a bug, and then the second time it was a piece of paper, and I was like, "Weren't you a piece of paper yesterday?" <laughs> and I, I guess he, yeah, that maybe that's true to just how well hidden all the bugs are. Is that like even the people that were publishing the game still didn't play it all the way through to see. Uh, all of the scenes they didn't comb through the data scenes. they were just like fuck it i guess not i, mean, I guess not man i don't know like the because uh, d was i think basically more or less like a launch title for playstation and a pretty early sega saturn game so there may have been some kind of rush there's it's it, that's one aspect of the story that is never quite saddled, saddled with, with you me. yeah it's like because it is cool to be like yeah. oh he he purposefully hid all the good stuff all the good grizzly stuff so that you know kids under 17 could get it mom mom will never know but also like does that mean that who was asleep at the wheel at a claim when you were publishing this <laughs> game later yeah i mean yeah it would have worked the first time right with the 3do maybe i mean i also wonder just institutionally thinking about the esrb and i don't quite know what that process was like back then. Um, but I know eventually it became a point where, you know, they only have a handful of people there. They're not going to play through every single game in its entirety. Um, and what they rely on is uh, developers or publishers sending a clip of all of the, you know, potentially borderline or violent things that are in their game. And so, and then, and then really on the back end, if they end up misrepresenting it in the final product and they get those complaints, that's where the hammer comes down. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, I'm really not sure like how it would have happened multiple times other than just being this, a niche enough title that everybody was that just, nobody really cool. noticed it. yeah, well yeah. they noticed, but they were just going to be cool about it. They weren't going to complain. Well, this is the point of the game almost like, uh, yeah, I'm, I'd be curious. Yeah, perhaps that, that, that that's just as plausible that like they did see the grizzly stuff and went, oh, that's rad. Oh, that's going to sell more. Yeah, the kid that's going to get people talking at the 
at the at the break room or at, at recess time. Yeah, oh, because it was the nineties. Oh yeah, the publisher probably would have little incentive outside of maybe you know whatever the penalties were, which were maybe increased just given that they were kind of hot off the heels of stuff like Night Trap and Mortal Kombat getting that attention. But yeah, and the ESRB was kind of new. Oh, how about that? The ESRB is new, and this game is pretty niche. It's not Mortal Kombat and selling, like, 100 million copies, and it's not in everybody's home. Yeah. And then maybe they also have it just go for certification once, and then whenever they port it to other systems, they just don't bother. It, it like, will yeah, forever fun. be a mystery how this game got T, and I. this is probably the most grisly, violent team ready game of all time. It might be. Yeah. But it's very artistically done, so so they have that. No, I, I guess it, it isn't. It, well, it's it, that those those scenes are kind of going for a shock, but like yeah. you know, we talked about you know earlier that like we're we're really put in uh, Laura's. Um, it's 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 a shock to the audience as well as Laura because the revelation mm-hmm. is shocking to her, it's shocking to the audience. It's to kind of make a point about how grim and grisly things are. It isn't just because you could say that like you know the fatalities in Mortal Kombat were just to get people talking. It was just, uh, yeah. it, it was just exploitative to be like, whoa, could you, you ripped just, like, put that guy's head off. What you know, yeah. um, that this does maybe serve a little more of a narrative focus, but. I just feel like there's the story behind that switcheroo that that Mr. Eno did. Uh, there, there's there's aspects of that story that I don't think we'll ever fully know. I wonder if there's somebody else on the team that we could ask. Because somebody because yeah. I can't imagine. I mean, maybe he made did all of that in secret by himself. But I'm at, I mean, when you have a small team like eight people like they're not going to snitch. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'd imagine they 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 know. But also, like, if you study Eno's career, like, that guy was a maverick. Uh, he was a genius. He was probably a bit of a pain in the ass to work with. But he was also just an absolute crazy person. An absolute, like, that kind of, like, artistic lunacy that you just, that culture really needs. Like, I, I, I still say that D2 uh, is, is not, a, not a great game. But, man, it just, like, all of his games just goes for it. And really just only a genius of that level could make a game flawed quite like that. And even like D, the, the, the faults of D, the idea is like it's a two hour interactive movie. Like there's plenty of criticism you can level at just that idea. Faults or feature? It, uh, precisely. Like it's, and that, that's probably he's like, you say a bad thing. I think it's great. And he, but it, it takes it takes a, lun- a lunatic like that to make a game like this in 94, 95. Um, yeah. So. It's his 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 legacy is that it, even if his games aren't good, which I do think that a lot of his games aren't necessarily good, they're all interesting. He's he had a fascinating uh, uh, not filmography, gamebography. Yeah, he, he had a fascinating resume. But you know what though, it takes me back to something that Brian has always said, and I and I really do appreciate it. Is you have to have somebody from outside video gaming try to make a video game. That's where you end up with things like this. When you get video game fans trying to make video games, that's where you end up with the ones where you're like um, Panzer Dragoon Remake, where you're asking yourself, what was the goal here? Why did we remake this game? Because the fans wanted it, because it's here, because it's and that. Yeah, but yeah. What, was the, what was the mindset? What was well, this I mean- and that? Well, Nothing. Two, just... two examples I can think of is uh, bringing in Shigesato Itoi to helm the Mother game, like uh, Mother and Earthbound. Like this total outsider who was just like a really interesting R uh, writer was like, I was one to kind of make fun of RPGs, and so the 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 Mother Earthbound series is just this really strange reaction to the JRPG. And then of course, uh, uh, oh my god, I'm totally blank. But the the oh my god. The Dark Souls guy. I had his name. Totally lost it. Oh, Miyazaki? Miyazaki. Thank you. <laughs> well, like, yeah, Miyazaki didn't get into games until he played Eco when he was in his 30s. And he was like, and then he shows up and, you know, he directs a couple of Armored Core games, but then he transforms Demon Souls into this kind of interesting, weird idea he had. Turns out that that was the template for Dark Souls, which is, you know, changed everything. And it was that outside perspective. He... Uh, is also a crazy genius, but he just wasn't so embedded in the culture of it. He just 
came in with a completely different mindset. And I think all our forms need to have outsiders that are just crazy mavericks. Like, have you ever thought to do it like this? Like, I guess we haven't. Well, again, the guy who made Pokemon was an ADHD bug collector. Yeah, oh, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And he's just like, I like collecting bugs. You might like it too. And now we're here celebrating yeah. 20 plus years of Pokemon. Turns yeah. out, turns out people might like that shit a lot. Yeah. I mean, even, <laughs> even Legend of Zelda, you know, was born of, of Miyamoto's enjoyment and fondness for playing out in the forest when he was a kid. And, and then there's like the look of Link. It's like, well, Mario's round and Mario's this and that. Why don't you make Link cute? You know what I mean? And they're just like, let's try something different. Or like the reason why Mega Man is blue is because that the NES palette had the most blues. So it's like if we want to make a dynamic character. Uh, we got to go with blue because that's the biggest our, our biggest like, you know, playroom there. Right. And some of history is made yeah. for the reasons of the console's limitations. I mean, that's and that's what I mean, yeah. uh, like good art is you know, having all the money in the world and all the talent in the world, yes, you can make fantastic stuff too. Uh, but, you know, the, the far end of it is like, you know, the best films, the best albums, the best games are the ones made under incredible uh, limitations and just really trying to push certain aspects of wherever the art is at that point. That's the stuff. That, and I appreciate those a lot. Stuff. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, it's like, yeah, we look at like, yeah, Terminator 2 is a great film, but it was also the most expensive film of all time when it was made. And then Terminator 1 was, you know, shoestring budget, like a couple million dollars. And but James Cameron was able to spin gold out of both of them. Uh, those are I also think of I think of stuff like that, too. When I think of like the PS5, we look at the PS5, it can have so many gigs or terabytes of information. Your games can be as big and expansive as they want, but the greatest air quote game of all time is 64 megabytes and is on N64. So yeah. Win back is fantastic. I agree. <laughs> Ocarina of time is the greatest game ever, ever. Nah, the, ca the camera sucks in that game <laughs> ever zero out of 10 bad camera, bad camera. No, that game was always, that game was always like a nine five for me. It was like, no, this is great. But like, man, the water temple's a bore. And then the stealth oh. section after that kind of sucks. I love the water temple. It's once you figure out that the missing key is under the block, the water temple is a breeze. No, I was always like, all right, I got to move the water to what level? And so I have to go where? And then, okay. So down, middle, here. up, down, middle, up, oh, down, God. middle, up. You just keep rotating the water and it solves itself. Like a Rubik's Cube. Yeah, except for like I said in the, in the middle of the water temple, there's like a, like, a, like a room you go into. And you'll go in there and you'll be like, I've run out of keys. I'm an idiot. I, I messed this temple up. But there's like a treasure chest under this block because the block floats up and down. So you actually have to go under it to get the missing key. Majora's Mask is always a more interesting game. It's a more interesting game yeah. because of the time traveling and stuff like that. It was so it's a harder cool. game, which is fair. And it's... it's I can't say it's a better game because I don't think it's a better game um, because the story isn't as streamlined um, because the game was rushed because it's missing two days or four days or something like that. Um, it could have been a better game. But I guess it, as I've gotten older, I've just appreciated games. It's like, yeah, you appreciate them in a different way. The more it's, it's like I, 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 a game like D is Resident Evil a better game is Silent Hill a better game? Probably. But I think their aspects of D is just more interesting. And I think just exactly. as I've gotten older, that just is more yeah. meaningful. It just went, it really went there. It wasn't trying to be uh, approaching any kind of trend or trying to, no. it just, it really was just. And I take so another one. And it doesn't even have to be a horror one. They could do a same game like this in any vein, fantasy, sci-fi. And I think I'd be in, I'd be in because I enjoyed this one. I will say though, that I, I do think that, it would, well, I, I was like, so I came to this podcast thinking, and then Nuno kind of changed my mind a little. But I, I was thinking, man, with like, you know, graphics how they are now with like a Unity engine or Unreal engines, it would be really cool to remake D just so I could have free look and walk around and really yeah. take a look at this world. Man, I thought they exactly the same thing. <laughs> the but then thing. it's like, yeah, you wouldn't quite get, but then it's like, you're not. Would it always, take something away? Yeah, it, it would. would. It would be it really too self referential. Like, the reason not D worked that, is like, because it... Yeah, yeah, sorry, go ahead. 
Oh, because I was watching this thing about Crash Bandicoot, and it was an Ars Technica thing. And the guy said when we were making Crash Bandicoot, you know, we were trying to figure out how to do 3D. But we decided that a better approach than giving players more control or more room was taking things away. Where the the first level you're on like that bear and you're go you're like running towards the camera or something like that. I think in Crash Bandicoot, and they said, well, that was the the thing. We've taken away your left and right. Now you have to go forward. That's it. You, we're giving you direction by taking away direction. So I think like like you guys said, by giving you control of D might take away from D. They give me a remake version where I can just. Because there's there's this handful of scenes where you're talking to your dad and Laura's like looking up and I'm like, oh, wow, they rendered like a ceiling there. There's like support beams. There's wood and carving in this area that you can only see briefly when she's kind of looking up like I, I did. And there's like all there's there's lots of rooms with beds in D. And yeah. I'm like, why is there? A, can I walk over to this? What's up with this bed? There's a bed here in this like torture chamber where this guy is trained to a wall. It's also a bed. And I'm just like, I want to look at this bed. How soiled is this bed? What, what's the material of this of the sheets on this bed? So maybe it's like remake D and try and to recreate the camera angles and all the camera movement and, you know, the facial expressions. So we're the storytelling is still there. But then new game plus mode. Give me free walk so I can look at how what's the silverware like on the dining room table? What's the what's inside? There's a handful of different. Uh, fireplaces and i think only get one that, like a, separate, really a look separate at. mode like a free a free roaming mode like do you want to explore the castle grounds and then you can just like you said walk your character around and pick stuff up yeah like beating the original silent hill on playstation on hard mode unlocks a first person mode and that game is so meticulously rendered it's it's very low poly it's super rough around the edges because it's a ps1 game but you know, walking around the first Silent Hill in first person mode and just looking at all the all the little work they did. It's 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 a great extra mode. Like I I, I love that stuff. And so I do think that I, w- I would absolutely play a D remake if I could just look at this stuff closer. Yeah, and I don't even want like modern graphics. I want the very the, the actual original yeah. assets just imported into Unity or Unreal or whatever. But the <sighs> very same assets but instead of being pre rendered now being played in real time. And I do I do agree that in terms of gameplay the D actually makes a, a great job in directing you towards the things that matter in terms of gameplay that you, you can interact with. Uh, if you had free roaming, it could actually make the game harder in that sense because you could get like fixated on an object that wasn't actually interactive and didn't you didn't yeah. need it for anything. Well, but, I mean, you, you, oh, sorry, oh, sorry, I was just I was just gonna say, I mean, you know, developers kind of take that approach these days by uh, building that into the visual language, right? So option, so items that. Uh, are unique or interesting or stand out like they're gonna put a little twinkle or put something just make them stand out a little bit more maybe it's the lighting of the space like there's a lot of cool tools they could work with from a modern sense to enhance well, like what vr they were back then yeah could you imagine it in a vr with a vr headset because then you could move in that snail's pace in those little blocks still but then you could just look around as you're standing in that block for that next thing you're supposed to be doing we're supposed oh, to go yeah. over there or oh, over yeah, there like, and then you press like forward there. and it only lets you go so far like the Google Maps, like when you're trying to go through your live view of like Google Street View. Like playing Resident Evil 4, Resident Evil 4 VR was like I'd walk up to the edge of a, uh, you know, of, of, of a, you know, a visible wall or a cabin and I would crane my head to look inside like what's what is in here? I can I normally can't look around this corner and. You know, for a handful of places, they actually did have to render something extra there. So in that regard, Resident Evil 4 VR was an absolute like stunner, just rendering that world in a way and letting you just get right up in it and just a way you you just you were never able to. And see, this is why I don't think we should call D a walking simulator, because I think Derek would really buy a walking simulator if they gave, if they sold him one. You know, <laughs> let me just walk around this world. Yeah, I don't I mean, need any bad guys. I don't need a story. <laughs> let me just walk around in VR. I want to see what's at the seven. Well, if there's 5th. if there's bad guys in their story, then there's a little more context to the 
the, the universe around it. I need gameplay too. I like shooting stuff also. Hey, I like <laughs> I like shooting blowing up stuff too. But also just I don't know, it's fun to go to a house of horrors and look at look yeah. look at the uh oh, the I ghost thought about that way. We were during the pandemic and I was playing um Yakuza like a dragon. You can go first person in that game and just wander around the town. And I did that a few nights because I felt trapped in the house for a couple too many times. I was like, oh, I'll just oh, wow. go for a walk around, you know, Tokyo for a while. Yeah. Oh, we could uh, we could plug that episode when because uh, we talked about that. I think that was the longest recording we've ever done. I think it was like three hours. And it was you, Cameron, yeah, and me, and then Casey uh, from Radio Sega, and then uh, Kinsey was, was with yeah. us too. Yeah, so we, that was that was a fun that was a fun one to to talk about. But um, yeah, I, I totally agree with everything that y'all said. I mean, I, I feel like the legacy of a D though may actually just be apparent in what are what is already in front of our faces, right? Like when you go on the Steam and you see a lot of indie games that do a lot of the stuff that we're trying to think through what a, a new D might do uh, from a modern context. I mean, you have a lot of games that kind of do that. And I wonder how many of those creators were inspired directly by the work of Eno and Warp, um, because I, I do see that legacy carrying on if indirectly. And, and that's pretty exciting, too. Yeah, a, a damn shame that he passed away. Yeah. God, he was like 50, 40 or 50. He was so uh, young. 40, he... 42, I think. Oh, my dude. Yeah, I, I'm almost 42 now. Like, that's just. Oh, so it's just so sad. And it's also like and not to be like, he did more games than just horror. Um. Oh, yeah. But he, he's one of those guys like, man, I wish he was still around. You know, like, what what, what would he be doing? He'd you know, probably like, be like two to 51. And just make you some crazy games that make absolutely yeah. no sense. And we need we need those. We need even if they're bad, you know, it's just you need we need people to just go out there and try with artistic. We need artistic lunatics. Lollipop Massacre, um, Asherah's Wrath, something of the Wait. damned or doomed. Shadows, Shadows of the damned. Of the damned? The, I don't know. Is this the... Lollipop Chainsaw. Yeah, the Suda 51 yeah. game. It's yeah, kill, kill and stuff like, like that. I, I don't like Deadly Premonition. It's just totally not for me. I think Deadly Premonition mm. is just fucking boring. However, I on in spirit, I absolutely support same th those games. Same. Yeah, actually, one of my favorite, and it wasn't even a horror game. Although when you in the early moments, it kind of builds itself as that until you understand what it is. But like stuff like Gone Home or or what remains of Edith Finch. I think those really played into that environmental storytelling a lot um, where like you inhabiting the space and you, you, you learn more about what's happened, uh, what the characters are like, what the vibe is like just by rummaging through <laughs> the stuff in those spaces. Um, and you know, there's like audio logs and that kind of shit as well, but it's kind of mixed with a broader body of, of those other uh, more interactive st storytelling devices. So maybe those are a couple of games that might be maybe not D esque, but at least sort of. You mean like your like abilities? indie indie inspired um, cinematic yeah. games? Absolutely. I mean, I mean, Eno is a indie dev, right at heart. Like if yeah, if yeah. indie devs were a thing, and and you know, granted they probably were, but they didn't get the budgets to be published in the way that Warp's work was. Um, yeah, I mean, we would, and, and also that's the thing I like about the tools that we have available now. I mean, uh, you know, say what you want about the business model of stuff like Unity and, and Unreal and all that, but they have enabled people who wouldn't traditionally have been brought up uh, with those skill sets uh, to have, they've kind of reduced that barrier to entry in a way that it opens the floodgates for people with really compelling ideas to be able to explore video games as a way to communicate them. Um, now the challenge obviously is the oversaturation and the challenge on the Steam and other retail sides is like, how do you curate them or, or have some sort of uh, way to get reliable attention to the projects and those creators that are really doing uh, great things. And that's a whole nother uh, question that I think even Eno was experiencing back in the day that we still haven't solved.
Yeah, that, that, that's where we are now. now. Yeah, when you have options to everything, well, that's like, yeah, you have a wall of games, you have a wall of movies, and then you have a huge, gigantic digital library at your fingertips, yeah. and you can't figure out what you want to do. You're like, yeah, I got, I got the whole night off. Well, what do I want to play? What do I want to do? I have no idea. I can't figure yeah. it out. <laughs> Well, on that note, I think we can wrap up. Is this, does anybody have any last thoughts or, or impressions or, or parting, I don't know, perspectives on D as we close out? And then we can just kind of... I think I got it all in. <laughs> is, right. the Mr., is the Mr. Bones episode happening next? Because that's actually Ooh. a Halloween game and that a Saturn is, exclusive. Yeah. I am not sure. I think we were planning to do this one and then Casper... Which uh, and deep we, fear, I think. Yeah, we may I not think. have time for deep fear because I would oh, need to replay. We might not. Yeah, I've been yeah. sitting on deep fear for years. We'll we'll do that. I mean, we don't need to necessarily wait till Halloween. To do that. We can maybe that. We can do it anyway. Yeah, even in November. <laughs> we'll do it later. Yeah, I, I mean, we don't really release episodes too often. We're kind of a. I alluded to it earlier. It's just kind of a pain in the ass for us to be able to schedule or find times that align for everybody. But um, also just. Uh, the, I think Buzzsprout without like they have limits like like three hours a month or something which we yeah and I better get, get, get to talk but... about Casper this month because yeah I still want to do that Casper. for sure and get Simon in on that that's his yeah what's up with I'll have to listen to that episode like what's up with Casper what's going on what? Casper's okay so it's a well it's like a Caspervania uh, if you can <laughs> imagine a game where you're in oh, a haunted no, house done you got it no done yeah. out sold it's it's really the word, good. The word is Caspervania. All you needed was that. <laughs> On that note, I think we can just start doing uh, our outro and stuff. So, uh, yeah, as we wrap up, um, I don't know if you all want to just tell us a little bit about what you're working on, if you have anything to plug, what your what projects you might be in the middle of that you'd want to share. But uh, we can just go around the room and wrap up with that. Uh, we'll start with you, Cameron. What, do you have anything? not really working on too much uh right now it's all just a bunch of i'll say like test test stuff to see and getting myself i guess ready for the whatever i'm going to be doing um but i can always be found all over the internet at sundane t-s-u-n-d-a-i-n mostly on facebook but you know all right uh nuno how about you you got some exciting stuff i know <laughs> I published the book. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you did. <laughs> Thank you, guys. So this may have kind of came out of nowhere because I never really mentioned that I was into writing. And the truth is, I, I haven't been lately. I was really into writing um, a while ago. Some 10 years ago, I published uh, several short stories between... 2012, 2013, 2014, around that period, I actually published a bunch of short stories and I wrote three full novels that I never managed to publish. This book was the last one. This was the last novel that I ever wrote back in 2014. So it's almost 10 years old by this point, but it had never been published. And then I, I kind of eventually quit writing for several reasons that I'm not going to get into. Um, not that they're very private or personal or anything. It's just that for time's sake. Um, but um, I've been, for the last couple of years, I've been kind of thinking of getting back into it. I wrote, I wrote a couple of short stories last year. Um, I'm kind of rusty, <laughs> kind of still trying to get back into into the pace. But um, yeah, I I was really happy with this particular book. So back when I first wrote it, I was really happy with it. I thought it really represented a new high, a new level that I had managed to achieve in my in my capabilities as an author, and uh, I thought it really deserved to see the light of day. So there was um, there was um, a contest um, made by a by a publishing house. They every year they set up a, a contest for novels that have never been published yet, and the uh, the actual prize is that they publish it. So I I tried it with this book last year. I won and it was published this year. It was actually published like a week ago in the beginning of October. 
Uh-huh. And um, yeah, it's it's fantasy. It's what I mostly write. I also write a bit of science fiction, a bit of horror, but I mostly write fantasy. It's uh, in the grim dark style. It was very much inspired by authors like Joe Abercrombie, Mark Lawrence. Well, George R. R. Martin is kind of <laughs> the go-to for this style, but <laughs> at the same time, it's uh, it's weird to give him a, as a, an inspiration because it's just I've gotten so like so mainstream and so uh, <laughs> it's it says a lot and says nothing at the same time but uh, yeah it's it's fantasy in that rough in that gritty violent style and it's only been it's only been published like a week ago as i said so i'm trying to publicize it as much as i can get word out there it's only in portuguese for the moment it's called pela cabeça do rei which literally means for the head of the king which kind of sets the tone. It's about an attempted regicide made by the main characters. <laughs> They're the bad guys. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm just seeing, I'm riding this wave and seeing where it takes me and see how things go if I can get back into writing seriously and maybe write other books after this one. I don't know. Let's see what happens. Oh, that's so fucking cool. Congrats, Nuno. Holy shit. Uh, where can we like can if you know if you do speak Portuguese or read it, uh, where might somebody try to acquire this novel of yours? So right now, uh, it you can, as the moment that we're recording this cast, you can't yet buy it because it was sold at the event where it was launched, you know, where where it was officially launched, and I made the presentation. But it should be maybe by the time that people actually listen to this podcast, it should be up for sale on the publisher's website, which is Editorial Divergencia, and the website is divergencia.pt. So uh, yeah, later on it should also be on regular bookstores, on the most popular bookstores in Portugal, like Wook and Fnac and stuff like that but for now for a while at least it should only be up for sale on the directly from the publisher's website so yeah if anyone listening to this podcast if you can read portuguese and if you're interested in dark gritty fantasy give it a try that's awesome um well yeah best of luck and uh i'll uh i'll put a link to that so just send that to me and i'll i'll uh, link it in the show notes Thank you very much, Matt. And uh, Derek, uh, you have a little YouTube channel, right? I do. Um, oh, do we want to do Sam first, or is he? Uh, do oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I just saw you in the order first, and my brain went there. Um, oh. Yeah. How about you, Sam? Uh, how, how? What? What do you? What do you got? I got a little two-year-old boy up in this room who's dead set and determined to raise all kinds of hell. Um, <laughs> No, uh, I've, I've actually recently oh, been able to. Idea. Yes, I know, Bubba. You want to go outside? He wants to go outside. I am Y'all home. Outside. I, I am home. In other words, if you have ever kept up with me um, for the past three years, I've pretty much been on the road nonstop. I uh, spent most of my time living in hotels, providing for my family, which means that my YouTube channel and everything else was basically put on the back burner uh, for the nearly 6,000 subscribers out there. Those of y'all who do listen to the podcast, um, I'm home now. So I'll actually be able to hopefully start working on the channel again. And, but more importantly, I've got to spend time with the youngins. I do want to say, I very much appreciate this because I'll be getting off as soon as I'm done with saying this. Um, I've appreciated getting back on the podcast. It's been awesome. Um, even if I haven't been able to be with my headphones on, but half the time, but it's, it, it, it's a lot of memories. Um, me and Brian and Nuno started this thing with Father K, and it's always great to get back on here. Um, as well, Derek, it's been awesome talking with you, man. I've been a fan of yours ever since I saw your first video on D way back whenever you were one of those video nerd dudes. Yep, um, yep. <laughs> the, the <laughs> thank, stop, you, thank you. The, the Stop Skeletons, y'all keep rocking, man. Very much enjoy y'all's content. And uh, tell, uh, tell producer Grace that um, we appreciate her work too. So, oh yeah, I will. Thank you. I will talk to y'all, gentlemen, later. It's been a pleasure, and everybody out there, y'all keep rocking and keep vibing. So, hey Sam, likewise. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for joining us, man. All right, y'all. Uh, and uh, yeah, Derek. Uh, 
Yeah, I don't know if you have any specific projects or anything. I know you, you and Grace get into the, the Hallows spirit, so... Yeah, I guess if you really want to, uh, I guess if 14 years ago I reviewed Doom, specifically this, uh, no, sorry, not Doom, D. Wow. I am working on a Doom video, but if you want to watch <laughs> old, the old D video, I think I was one of the first, if not the first person on YouTube to actually review D. I think there are gameplay videos and stuff, but I think I was one of the first to do it. And then I did uh, a couple of years later in 2010, I reviewed Enemy Zero and D2. And I think those two videos are still pretty good. I think that first D video I did, not not so good. But I guess if you want to go back and watch those, they're there. But uh, I, probably, I don't know about that when this is coming out. But by the time it's out, uh, I, I just wrapped up a video on the PlayStation version of Doom, which is my, my favorite version of Doom because it kind of pushes Doom and makes it into a full uh, horror game. Like, if you liked Doom 64, uh, because... Doom 64 like pushed the pushed that game to a full horror mode. However, it was uh, didn't have the classic Doom maps. So if you want, if you really liked Doom 64 but wished you could play it on classic Doom maps, that is basically what PlayStation Doom is. And so I have a video where I gush about that kind of old school HVGN style, like Sam was saying. Uh, but other than that, yeah, we have a bunch of stuff coming out. Stop skeletons from fighting on. Uh, on YouTube, we also have our little podcast I do with uh, uh with Grace and myself. We just kind of talk about what we are working on, a little more in depth for videos that are working on. And also, just kind of shoot the shit. It's a very chill, very chill podcast. But also, in the in the meantime, I've been I, I've been trying to get back into music, making more music this year, and I've been plugging away at that. So, oh nice. I'll I'll, I'll maybe get to actually upload some of it one of these maybe sometime soon i'm feeling a little more confident that the stuff i'm making is actually like kind of all right good maybe worth uh uh sharing but um yeah the uh when i reviewed uh, d and d2 i typically like to use the music that's in the games but for those games there's not a whole lot of music you can put in the background so uh, i've always kind of liked those videos because especially the d2 video it's actually made of music that I made with my old, uh, my old band. So that's oh, kind that's, of a... That's awesome. Yeah. But other than that, no, I'm just, uh, man, this is, this, this is our job. So I, I'm always doing stuff. I gotta, I gotta pay the rent. Gotta keep the lights on. So now new videos always coming. And, uh, hopefully that doom video out by the time this is out. If not, check out, we did a crash bandicoot nitro car 3d. Uh, you have no idea how complicated those the mobile Crash Bandicoot racing games get. An absolute web of insanity. Uh, that video is out on our channel right now. I would, think. Would Check you it out. would you say the uh, saga of uh, Crash Bandicoot Nitro Kart is more or less convoluted than Kingdom Hearts? It's like Kingdom Hearts has a complicated in-game story. There are technically five games called that have the words Crash and Nitro and Kart, and they're all different. I thought it was the same game. No, <laughs> no, oh, <laughs> they're man. not. There are. There's a game called Crash Bandicoot Nitro Kart Two, and a game called Crash Nitro Kart Two, and neither of them have really anything to do with Crash Nitro Kart, unlike the PlayStation Two. What about Crash Nitro Kart Refueled? Is that the same game? That is the remake of... Game. Yeah, the, the, the Nitro Refueled is like a remake of like the first game, but with like a lot of the courses from the second and third game, which mm. the first game is Crash Team Racing. The third game is Crash Tag Team Racing. But it does have Yaya Panda, who was a character that was only in the mobile games. It's all explained, Dan Video Watch it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, there you go. You gotta watch it. <laughs> What a cliffhanger. Uh, no, uh, yeah, well, I appreciate you for, you know, I'm sorry this went long. We were really originally going to plan to do this for about an hour and maybe a little change. Uh, but, that's, uh, I can ramble about good video games and I'm always <laughs> going off topic. And so that's that's partly my fault, I'm sure. No, we well, it's all it's all of us. But no, I, I greatly appreciate uh, you taking the time uh, to do this and joining us today. It's been fun. Uh, I am. 
I don't know. I'm not like, I guess I do Twitter. I'm at virtuous schlub, um, but I don't check a lot of other stuff very often. And I have a blog called uh, the virtua planet.com. And that's just me trying to find my voice as I ramble about uh, video games through a variety of blog posts. So hoping to use that to kind of refine my style and, and maybe build that into something uh, down the line. Um, but yeah, thank you all for joining. And I'm, uh, yeah, this is a lot of fun again. And yeah, I don't know a good way to like exit this thing. Cause is there a good Laura, Laura, Laura. Laura. you back. need to go back, go you back, need to go back, Laura, do not cross over to this side. The Bartha will close. I mean, the obvious joke is Laura, La- is this, is this thing on test? Laura up? No, Laura. Laura. Don't look down. I've always been up. Laura, come on. <laughs> Laura, follow my voice. <laughs> yeah. Testing, uh, testing. One, two. Can you hear me? Laura? Is this? I don't know how to work it, honey. But Laura, I need you to come hit. Classic dad. Classic dad doesn't know how to use the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> the, the brain ghost technology is a little too complicated for him. <laughs> Hey again, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for listening to this episode of the uh, Titan cast. Uh, I would be remiss if I'd also didn't mention the variety of places that uh, were available on the internet uh, with the Saturn junkyard. Um, there are a few of them. And the first one is the main blog and website, which has about well, 15 years or so worth of uh, blogs and write-ups and stuff uh, for you to check out if you're interested. And that's at uh, the Saturn junkyard dot blogspot dot com. Um, we're also updating that with a number of uh, pretty great articles from uh, Virtua Neptune um, this Halloween season. So keep an eye out for those. Uh, there's also the uh, Saturn Junkyard Twitch channel, which is run by Tom McComb. Um, definitely check that out. That's uh, the Saturn Junkyard, or just if you search for it at Twi- on Twitch, it should should just be there. <laughs> Same with our Facebook group. We have a Facebook community and a Facebook page. Uh, I'm not even really sure what the link is or URL is for that, but just, just search Saturn Junkyard. It'll show up. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel, which is run by Nuno. Um, and that is uh, just youtube.com slash the Saturn Junkyard, I believe. Um, again, just search for Saturn Junkyard. It's there. Uh, and then finally, we have our Twitter, which is at Saturn, uh, excuse me, at Saturn Junkyard uh, on Twitter. So, yeah, with that, thank you very much uh, for listening again. And, uh, yeah, have a have a rad Halloween season.